Why is Linda King? She got her cat with her. <laughs> oh, hey, sweetie. She doesn't miss a thing. I think he has yeah. all the political rights standing. Um, he is a, he's a citizen that should be presumed, presumed innocent before everybody's eyes. She doesn't miss a thing. Yeah. Maleska, could you explain, though, as you mentioned, uh, the annulment was a, a procedural uh, a decision, not a substantive one. So Lula, I'm picking up sound from... So, as you mentioned, uh, the announcement was a, a Ben, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Yeah, we're good. I'm just sticking it up on Facebook and YouTube Live. We'll be right back. Okay, fine. Give me 30 seconds. Be right there. Ben, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Yeah, we're good. I'm just sticking it up on Facebook and YouTube Live. We'll be right back. Okay, fine. Give me 30 seconds. Be right there. Ben, All right. Hey, Don. Hey, crowd. Okay, we got a big crowd. That's good. Yeah, we're we're at uh, fifty already, and it's sorry about being late. Yeah, I was a little nervous about that. Uh, yeah. Sorry, it's happening. Um, I knew it this afternoon. I looked at it. I had it marked on the calendar. And yeah. I just uh, we're if by chance I don't know how anybody would know, but we're live on YouTube and live on Facebook, as I understand it. Okay. All right. Uh, well, should we begin then? You got it. You want to introduce our guests? Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, well, welcome, uh, everyone. Um, I'm very pleased to present our uh, program for this evening. It's um, uh, Prairie Haven, um, Prairie and Savannah Restoration on an old Wisconsin farm with Marcy and Mike O'Connor. Um, Marcy and Mike are with us this evening to tell us about their uh, undertaking to restore the crop fields of a farm they bought in the year 2000 uh, to prairies that thrive with birds and other wildlife that have returned and now share the land with them. Marcy will talk about the restoration of the farm and Mike will tell about his project to record the sounds of birds and other animals. And he will use the recordings to document what they've done. Um, I think we had um, a link out there uh, to their um, uh, recordings. Uh, maybe we can get that out to the, uh, our audience. It's really wonderful. It's uh, really an immersive experience with uh, photographs and sounds of the, the prairie. So um, hey, Don, anyway, uh, Marcy has a B. Yeah. On that link is posted. Yeah website on the event page there's a link to their video which is yeah it's quite good oh okay all right yeah it is quite good it's really an immersive experience and to those of us who have been cooped up for a long time it's like a breath of fresh air um anyway marcy has a ba in biology from grinnell college 
and an MA in design from the University of Minnesota, and many years of experience doing smaller restorations. Mike's managerial and technical background provided the foundation for serving as operation manager and maintenance staff for the restoration. He's the audio ID half of the bird watching team, where being a lifelong musician comes in handy. So you can also find out more about their project at prairiehaven.com. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Marcy and Mike. Welcome. Hi. Good evening. Now we have to share our screen, right? Yeah, we're going to share our screen that? and we'll Absolutely. get that going. You may have to give me permission. Is that... Uh... Should be on. Okay, well, see if you can... Oh, yep, I'm seeing it. Oh, good. Okay, there you go. That's great. Okay. I'm well, already jealous. <laughs> <laughs> well, we thought it, we'd show you a whole bunch of bird pictures just to start since you guys are Audubon. Um, I'm going to talk to you this evening about this big re habitat restoration project that we're doing. Um, I'm going to talk about the kinds of restoration work we're, do we're doing and how it's changed the landscape and a bit about our effort to learn about the plants and animals that share the land with us. Mike helps with a lot of the restoration work, but he's also a musician and does a lot of work with computers. And he's gotten really interested in the bioacoustics of this place. And he started using some of the results in our Seasons 2020 videos, which is the video that um, uh, Don and talked about um, that there's a link to on your webpage. And we'll give you that link at the end also. Um, Anyway, Mike is going to talk about that part of the adventure. So this adventure began in 2000 um, when we bought this land. We bought 425 acres of what had been a dairy farm. Um, and then we've added about 70 acres since then. So now we're just under 500 acres. It had been farmed um, since the 1850s, most of that time as a dairy farm. The cows had been, when we bought it, the cows had been gone for about 25 years. The crop fields were all rented out to a neighboring farmer and the land was rented to hunters. This is what it looked like that first year that we bought it in 2000. The crops um, that year were, the crop fields were all planted in soybeans that year. I was really interested in, I've always been interested in native landscapes and I thought it would be really fun to see if we could make it look the way it did before the European settlers came. What's happening here? Uh, I don't yeah. know. Oh. oh, I went too far. There we go. Um, this is one of the flat fields on top of the hill, so you can get a little more sense of what the rest of the land looks like. Um, and you can see the kind of scale we were working with. We had no idea what we were getting into. Um, we had no idea how much work it would be how much we would have to learn or how long it would take. We figured this is a 150 year project and we're only 30 years in or 20 years in, so we got a long way to go yet. We have to live to be really old. Um, I wanted to define a couple terms before we start. Just, you probably already know this, but I'm just gonna make sure. Um, native plants or animals are usually defined as ones that were here before the Europeans came. Plants and animals have always moved around, but before the Europeans came, they moved more slowly. When the Europeans came from all the way up on the other side of the ocean, they brought animals and plants with them. And um, a lot of, you know, with all those uh, times that they came back and forth, they brought um, animals and plants from much farther away than they had ever come before. Um, and that movement of plants and animals has continued ever since. So we have thousands of non-native plants and animals that live here now. Um, and they've come from places that are very far away. Most of the, many of those are not a problem. You know, you could think of crop plants like wheat and soybeans. Those are not native plants. Um, there are a lot of garden plants like lilacs and zinnias, which are not native. And none of those are a problem. But when they escape into the wild and start taking over native landscapes, that becomes a problem. And we call those invasive species. And these are two of the invasives that we're constantly fighting, um, garlic mustard and bush, hunt, 
um, bush honeysuckles, um, just to give you an example. But that's one of the big things that we have to work on is invas invasive species. So back to the story. Um, our land is in western Wisconsin, Buffalo County, if you know where that is. It's about 100 miles from, um, southeast of the Twin Cities. It's in the Driftless area, the part of the Midwest that was never covered by glaciers. And as a result, the landscape is very rugged. Um, it has very steep hills and narrow valleys. This is a drone video that Mike took of part of our land. Um, you can see on the top, there's a big field that used to be a um, farm field, and it's now been planted in prairie. Um, if you look down on the bottom right side, there's a um, bluff prairie that's got the sun shining on it. Um, some people call those goat prairies. Uh, it's a south-facing point that was never farmed because it was too rugged and too steep. This is a view from one of our goat prairies looking out down the rest of the valley. For thousands of years before European settlement, most of this land was a mix of prairie and savanna, with woods on the north-facing slopes of the hills and wetlands and streams at the bottom, um, in the bottoms of the valleys. When the settlers arrived, they farmed the flat valley bottoms and the flat tops of the hills, but they didn't do much to the sides of the hills. So this, the hills are still pretty wooded. Oop. Since the land is so rugged, there were a lot of places they just couldn't farm. So our land still had a lot of the remnants of that pre-settlement landscape. There were dry bluff prairies on the south facing points. This is one of them. Um, much of the woods is actually savanna. Savanna means scattered trees, usually oaks, with prairie vege vegetation in between. And you can see, if you look really carefully here, you can see some of the big old oaks, but um, brush and, and little trees have all grown up in between, so it just looks like um, brushy woods now. Um, much of the valley floors had been drained so that people could plant crops but there are still places that haven't been drained and they still have wet prairies in them. And we still have lots of woods on the, especially on the north facing hillsides. Um, this is a north facing hill that was probably always woods. Um, it had never been savanna. When we bought the land, 150 acres of it was cropland that was being planted in a rotation of corn and beans. And that was the first thing we worked on, um, planting those crop fields into prairies. So every year after the farmer harvested his crop, we would take one field, usually about 20 acres, and plant it with prairie seeds. It took us about eight years to do all of them. I collected as many of the seeds as I could, about half the seeds we used. We bought the rest from native plant nurseries. I used only seeds that were native to this area. These are piles of seeds drying in our basement. We basically filled our whole, the floor of all of our house with piles of seeds like this in the years that we worked on these. I planted most of the prairies by hand in the winter by throwing the seeds out on top of the soil. So this is one of those planted prairies. This is, um, I thought I would show you how it's changed over the years. This is an old picture of it before when it was a soybean field. And this is the winter I planted it. It was a very snowy winter, so I planted it, most of it on snowshoes. You can, there are my tracks. And this is that very first summer. Um, in the first summer, prairie plant plants usually grow down. Um, they mostly establish their roots that first year. And the plants that grow up are usually annual weeds. So we would mow every three or four weeks all summer long. So it looked like a giant lawn. So you can see Mike out there in the tractor mowing away. The mowing keeps the weeds down, keeps the weeds from going to seed, and it also gives the prairie plants more light. So it's really helpful to do that the first year. The second year, the flowers start to come, and you start to actually see prairie plants. There's still quite a few weeds, so we did mow a few times this summer, but not as, much, not as often, um, only when it seemed like there were too many weeds. 
And this is a few years later in 2008. So this is about uh, four years old. And um, you can see there are a lot of flowers now, but there aren't very many different kinds. There, so there's not much diversity. But it was still pretty satisfying, pretty beautiful. This is that same prairie in uh, year five. So it's five years old, and it's, you can see it's getting a lot more diverse. The grasses are starting to come in. Grasses are really slow, so the flowers come pretty fast. It usually takes four or five years for the grasses to start showing up. And just so you know that prairies, these prairies are not perfect, um, this was a year that the Queen Anne's Lace did really well. And there's just nothing we can do about Queen Anne's Lace. It's a beautiful flower, but it's not native. Um, it doesn't seem to cause a lot of problems in prairies, except that it looks bad. Um, and it kind of makes it hard to see the native flowers because it's so tall and so white. Um, so I don't like it. If I could get rid of it, I could. I would get rid of it if I could, but I can't. So we just had to live with it this year. And then the next year's, it kind of disappears gradually over the next few years. This was um, that same prairie this past summer. This is the way it looks now. Um, there was hardly any Queen Anne's lace. And uh, this is early in the summer, so there aren't very many grasses showing yet. This is later in the summer. You can see that there are a lot of grasses. You can still see the plants. They're still um, blooming. They're still getting a lot of light, but there are a lot of grasses blooming too. So you can see that the prairies, the, this prairie is now um, 20, no, 18 years old. And you can see it really changes over the years. It still changes. Every year it's different. So it's always exciting to see what the prairies are going to look like every year. So now another thing we wanted to work on was the pieces of the original landscape that were still here. Um, remnants of the bluff prairies and the wet prairies and the savannas. This is a bluff prairie. Um, we have five of these big bluff prairies, um, and they all are kind of like this. There are open areas where the, the prairie is still pretty predominant, and then the edges of it um, have grown up with shrubs and small trees, um, a lot of birches and aspen, which like uh, the sunlight that they get in a prairie area. This is what the sides of the, that prairie looked like. Just a tangle of bushes and um, birches, mostly. And if you, but if you look underneath, on the, growing on the ground, there were prairie plants that were trying to grow underneath all that brush. So I started clearing. Um, I, I really just wanted to get rid of the brush so the, the prairie plants would get more sun. I didn't plant anything here. I just took away the things that were, were um, blocking the sun. I, it's pretty easy to cut the, the little stuff, the brush. I would cut and treat the stumps with herbicide so that they wouldn't come back. The bigger trees are harder. And when they're really big, what we tend to do is um, do what's called girdling, where we cut a ring of bark around the outside of the tree. Um, and that kills the tree, but we don't have to actually cut it down. So we would let the trees die, and then they'd fall down on their own. It's a lot safer and easier for us to do it that way. So we did, that's what we did on this one. So the bigger ones are just, have been girdled, and they're just dying there. And in the meantime, before they fall down, they provide a lot of habitat for woodpeckers and insects. So this is that same bluff prairie this past summer. And you can see most of the birches are gone. It's a lot more open. There are still some birches down the hill that haven't fallen down yet. They're dead, but they haven't fallen. And this is the same prairie with some more flowers. These are flowers that were here all the time, but now they're flowering because they're getting more sun. This is um, prairie coreopsis and harebell. The purple ones are harebells. This is that side hill that had that was covered with brush. And you can see there's, there's still some brushy stuff left, but I've gotten rid of most of it. The yellow flowers are hoary pacoon, a flower that grows on dry prairies. And again, I haven't planted anything here. This is just things that came back. And that's what the hoary pacoon 
looks like close up. I'm just starting now to plant things on these prairies to make them even more diverse. So if there are some things that I know should grow there that I can get local seeds for, um, I'm starting to plant those. So this is a plant that uh, it's called a um, wood lily or a prairie lily, prairie lily. And a friend of ours uh, grew it from seed, from local seeds, and uh, I planted it on this prairie and I'm hoping it will thrive there and hopefully spread. This is an, a picture of another kind of prairie that we have. Um, we, don't, we don't have very many of these. This is a flat prairie. It's not a bluff prairie. Um, it's not on a, a point. It's just a flat area that was never plowed for some reason. And we have a couple of these places. They're, they have different vegetation than the bluff prairies. Um, this one uh, had lots of brushy um, shrubs and some small trees, but there were a lot of open spaces too, and we just started mowing it. We mowed it every year for many, many years. Um, in the beginning, we weren't very good at cutting down trees, so we just left the trees, and then later on, we were too busy doing other things. So we just, um, we just basically mowed it for many years, and we didn't plant anything, and this is what it looked like three or four years ago. So it still has the little trees, but a lot of the prairie plants came back. And then finally, um, a few years ago, we got uh, good enough at cutting trees, we decided we really needed to get rid of those trees. So this is what it looked like last summer. The little trees are gone. The trees around the edge are mostly oaks. So it's, it's sort of turning into oak savanna at the edges. The next thing that we decided to tackle was the savanna, which is a lot of the woods. Um, these trees are what are called open-grown oaks. It mean they're had they have really wide spreading branches, and the reason that they grew that way is because when they when they were growing up, they didn't have lots of trees around them. They had lots of light and lots of space, and so the trees could the branches could spread out. If they had grown in a woods where there were lots of trees close by, the branches would have grown up trying to reach the light. So when you see trees like this in a woods, it probably means it used to be a savanna. And you can see how much underbrush there is. It's pretty overgrown. We looked at these woods for years and years and just didn't know how to even start. But finally, in 2013, we decided, OK, we're just going to do a project. So we picked out this tree, this big old oak in the middle, and decided we would try to liberate it. We would cut all the brush and trees around it. So we started cutting, making piles of the cut stuff, and uh, we treated all the, you know, we would cut the brush and treat the stumps so they wouldn't come back. Mike would carry the piles away into the woods and make a, a big pile back in the woods. We, used, we started burning piles in the beginning, but it takes a lot of time and energy that we didn't have. So we, uh, and we have so much land that we would just, we still just, um, move our piles away into the woods and let them decompose on their own. And in the meantime, as they're decomposing, they provide a lot of habitat. So this is after we'd finished that fall. We got so excited about liberating that one oak that we just kept going for until mm -hmm. the snow came. Um, and this is what it looked like when we were done. It was pretty exciting to see the savanna emerge from this brushy woods. And this is the same place after it had been growing back for a couple of years. The savanna plants are starting to come back. Um, it's a really lovely spot now. We have a lot of these former savanna areas, and every we love doing this kind of work. So every year, we every fall, we pick out another spot and do a, um, another project like this. This is one we did a few years ago. So a lot of our woods is now turning into savanna. One last place that we um, like to work on is the remnants of the wetland. So this is a creek that runs through the front of our property. And on both sides of it, it has wetland. Um, some of the wetlands in pretty good shape. This one uh, 
I haven't done anything to, and it's um, got lots of diversity, lots of different kinds of plants, native plants. Um, this is another part of the wetland. This is a spring. We have many springs that run down into the creek. Um, and this is one of them, and it's surrounded by sedge meadow. So these are the tufty things are all sedges, and the yellow flowers in the middle are marsh marigolds. So there are a lot of those were in pretty good shape. But then we had places like this. This is um, an area that had uh, drain tile put in, so it was drained for crops, and it was just full of weeds. This, uh, the yellow flower is wild parsnip, which you probably have heard of. It's a terrible invasive, uh, and you can see it really fills up places like this. We had a lot of different, a lot of places that had a lot of wild parsnip. So I've spent the last 10 years or so pulling a lot of parsnip. And um, we had a, f a few areas sprayed, but mostly it's been pulling parsnip and mowing parsnip. And this is an area that used to be, have a lot of parsnip in it, and it doesn't have very much anymore. And these are seeds I've planted, wetland seeds, and it's coming back pretty well. This is another area that used to be almost all parsnip. And now it's a pretty diverse wet prairie. So once we started getting natives in these fields and more diverse natives in the remnants, we started seeing a lot more creatures, um, a lot more insects, a lot more um, animals, all kinds of um, different creatures. My background is in uh, botany, so I knew a lot about the plants, but I didn't know very much about the animals. So I've spent a, a lot of time learning to identify the plants and, or the animals that we see. These are monarchs and painted lady butterflies on uh, rough blazing star. This is in one of the planted prairies. This is another planted prairie. This is um, showy goldenrod. Goldenrods are great um, plants to attract that attract insects. And there are all kinds of insects in this picture. There are a bunch of bumblebees, and there's a pair of um, mating uh, beetles in the middle, the orange, beetle, orange and black beetles. And there's a moth, and there's a flower fly down kind of on the bottom left under that bumblebee. This is a, a giant swallowtail butterfly, the largest butterfly we have here. And it's nectaring on swamp thistle, which is a lovely um, native thistle that grows in wetlands. These are the caterpillars of an unusual butterfly that lives in wetlands called a Baltimore checker spot. And these are uh, a group of um, adult Baltimore checker spots on our driveway. Male butterflies need uh, various minerals that they use in mating. And so when you see butterflies um, doing what's called puddling, which really means um, being on the ground, sucking up things from the soil or sometimes from animal scat, um, that's what they're doing. They're trying to get minerals to use in mating. And so we see these butterflies on our driveway a lot. Um, we started seeing a lot of interesting birds. This is a Henslow sparrow. We had several pairs of them living in our, one of our planted prairies in the last couple of years. And this is a willow flycatcher, one of the birds that lives in our wetland. And barred owls. We, we love these owls. We've, um, I'm sure that we have a nest in one of our valleys. We haven't been able to find the nest. But um, this is one of the young barred owls that we saw this summer. We have, um, I, I looked this up before the talk so I would know how many, species, how many species of birds we've seen. We've seen 147 species so far on our land. It's trickier to see animals when they come out at night or, come, or um, don't like being around people. So um, we put up a bunch of trail cameras that take pictures um, they're, mo they're triggered by motion, and they take pictures of animals when we're not around. This is a bobcat, and they also take pictures at night. So these, this is a mama bear and her cub. Another nighttime thing that I do is I got in really interested in moths, and moths are 
most moths are out at night. So the way to um, learn about them it was to um, put out lights. And moths, for some reason, no one really knows exactly why, but they're attracted to lights. So I put up, um, I have this light set up on the door of our garage, and um, I try to attract moths, and then I take photographs and try to identify all the moths that I see. We saw, we, I'm still amazed at the huge variety of moths that I've seen. Um, this is a polyphemus moth, which is as big as my spread hand. It's a huge moth one of the biggest ones. And these are tiny moths. These are about an inch long, each of these. And we see everything in between. Um, I've identified more than 850 different species of moths here on our land in the, about the last 10 years. So that's my story about what we've done. Um, it's definitely work in progress. We're still working on uh, the native ha bringing back native habitat and contr controlling the invasive species. And we're still documenting what we see. We're still seeing lots of new animals and sometimes even new plants um, all the time. People often ask us why we're doing it. And we, there are all kinds of reasons. It's really interesting. We learn a lot. And we think it's important to support native habitat. But most of the reason we do it is just because it's fun. We really have a great time. So now it's Mike's turn. He's going to talk about the sound recording work he's doing. And we're going to do a set change because <laughs> there we are to buttons to places. push and knobs to turn. And so we're going to trade places here. It'll be a short. See if we can pause. keep from getting tangled up in the cords. Yeah. One of the gizmos <clears throat> went kerflui just before the meeting. and. So we're limping along on headphones. It's a new fashion thing, this headphone stuff. Um, the other thing I want to do for just a minute is drop out of screen sharing, I think. Or at least I want to turn on original sound. Yeah, there I can do that without. So is the sound, give me some thumbs up there, Ben. Can you hear the sound still? Yes? Good, okay. All right, so uh, off we go. Oop, not that way. We're not gonna go like that. Let's try that. Yeah, we're good. Everything's good here. Okay. Well, I was reading my email this morning and uh, I'm subscribed to an Audubon uh, email feed because we have the, the bird identification app on the phone, and mostly what we use it for is uh, checking out bird calls when we don't know what we're hearing. And here's this article that's on the Audubon site. It was uh, back from April 2019, uh, and a, a whole big spiel about the very thing that I want to talk about for the rest of the talk, which is this whole thing of being able to ID birds by sound and visualize that uh, identification. Uh, the pictures you see on the right are uh, the sort of the visual representation of what these bird calls look like. So that's that's what this this that was like a perfect lead-in. Um, this is a a, th uh, a s sort of the title slide from a show or a, a talk I gave a few months ago about all this because uh, this project that we're doing here we've called uh, Ears in the Driftless. We're trying to recruit other people, uh, especially in the Driftless area, to do this same sort of thing. Uh, so sort of the quick what, why, how. Uh, you can read down there. It's it's the combination of acoustics and biology. Uh, we're doing this to document the way the sound changes as we change the habitat here. And uh, uh, one of the problems that we've run into is that we'd like a time machine. If anybody in the audience happens to have a time machine that could take us back about 20 years, so that we could put these things in and start capturing the sound from 20 years ago and we started, that would be great. 
Um, that's sort of the theme of this slide. You're going to see some of the same pictures. Uh, Marcy and I mm. think along the same lines when it comes <laughs> to picking out cool pictures of the place. Uh, that's, that's a picture you've already seen from Marcy. And, you know, just like photos, it's really hard to capture sound from 20 years ago, but it sure would be nice if we could. Uh, that little comparison is what that's all about. And the other thing I'm going to do for a minute is take a little tour over to Marcy's website, prairiehaven.com. Uh, it's right there. It's really easy to read on Zoom, but we'll give you a bigger version in a minute. But uh, we've got sliders. So this is the farmstead. I like this technology. Doesn't yeah, it? cool, huh? Uh, the... Uh, when do we think this was? 30s? I think it was from the 30s. Yeah. yeah. And here comes the slider. See, check this out. How about that, huh? I love that slider. So this is the way it looks now in the winter. Uh, here's another slider. You remember that picture? Marcy showed you that picture, too. And here's the slider version where you can see the difference between then and now. I'll go through these pretty quickly because you already heard about this from Marcy. This is a soybean field and the way it looks. A couple of years ago it's gotten a little heavy on the raspberries. Certain people who do the mowing are getting a little behind on that one. This is another soybean field. And here's another That's view. The one That's, seen. Hmm? That's the one they've already seen. Oh well. A couple of times. Yeah they see that that's that is a repeat. This they haven't seen, no. but this, they've seen this place because that's that cool tree that we liberated, one of them. Uh, they've seen this. There's the intermediate. Oh, they saw that. I'm really going fast because, <laughs> and there's, there's the tree that you, we liberated. Yeah, we've, yeah, we've seen all this. Okay, okay. enough of that. Um, the next thing, Thing that we want to get into is this whole thing about bioacoustic monitoring, which is a huge field. There's no way that I'm going to even be able to s scratch the surface. But if you want a, a really terrific TED Talk about this, uh, check out Bernie Krause's uh, TED Talk uh, on, on the web. Bernie Krause is like a a god in this community and what a lot of this is about is documenting habitat loss. Um, the good news story is that what we're doing here is restoring habitat and so as a result what we're doing is frantically trying to establish some baseline data so that we can compare uh, as things get better and again it's too bad we didn't start 20 years ago but who knew? This is kind of a busy slide um, that shows uh, an, an aerial of the farm with the three dots. We have three of these recorders sprinkled around. Um, the one at the bottom is right in the middle of the wetland. The one in the middle is right by the house. And the one up in the top is in one of the restored savannas that we've got. Um, and the other talk, I was getting uh, terribly into the amount of data that we're collecting. Uh, for this talk, I'm just going to say it's a boatload. Uh, and uh, if people want to know more, uh, we can maybe pick that up in questions at the end. Um, these are the gizmos that I tried out. Um, and... They range from the one in the upper left is very fancy pro level audio gear. Um, the one on the lower right is my phone with a, a really neat microphone plugged into it that we used for years to capture this. The one on the lower left is a tiny little device that, that uh, only costs about 70 or $80 called a something or other moth. I'll get to that in a second because I can't remember. 
And then the one in the upper right is the gizmos that we're actually using now. Um, and at this point, I'm going to go, I think, to the comparison page. Yeah, on my site. So this is the ears in the Driftless site. And we're going to give you that link at the end, too. Those are the same pictures. And I want to share with you some of these audio files. So what I did on this page is I, I told people why I bought the ones I bought. The ones I bought are called Wildlife Acoustics SM4s. And the reason I bought them was because while it's not absolutely the very best, it's a whole lot cheaper than the really best. Uh, it goes forever on batteries. Uh, it's weatherproof, and it can be scheduled, whereas none of the others can really do that. But now we're going to get to the audio part of all this stuff. What I did is I recorded the same exact... I, I turned all the recorders on at exactly the same time, and I'm going to show you uh, how they sound different by actually playing an audio app. So I'm going to start with the absolutely fanciest um, gear. It's about $4,000 worth of gear, so it's pretty fancy. It's not weatherproof, but it really is a beautiful recorder. And uh, Ben, give me a thumbs up if you can hear this, okay? But here I'm, here I'm playing it. Can you hear that? Good deal. All right. Yeah, we're good. Okay. Lost you. Their computer froze up. <laughs> Got it. And Mike, if you can hear me, we've lost you. Send him a message in chat. Here they look. Oh, that's too bad. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Still there. He lost his phone. Yeah, he's frowning. Uh... It's still clicking. What's the, the ding, ding, ding? What's these? Yeah, I can't hear you. No, it's like a, can you hear me? Okay. It's like a sound file locked and it's beep, 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 beep. Did your, did your sound file, you might stop and start that. No, I got ding, 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 ding. Oh, that's too bad. Uh, I don't know what to do. So you may have to reboot. Uh, sure. Okay, if folks can hear me, Mike's going to reboot, see if he can clear that. Some file has locked. Anybody want to go mow lawns on 500 acres?
Let's go to galleries, not, not back yet. There he comes, admit. All right, he's on his way back in. No, he's still, uh -uh. No, yes, no. I hear you. Well, how about that? Yep, you're back. That dink, dink, dink was still there for a minute. But it may have cleared. Well, I don't hear it now. You're back in the driver's seat. I'm going to have to. Uh, I was trying to get anybody to volunteer to come back into chat. Can hear you. I wonder how I got internet out in the middle of the. Ken? Yeah. Can you take a question? We were a little late because we had another Zoom, but you mentioned something about mowing. Do they have to mow those acres? They've been <laughs> mowing huge chunks of it to get started. When they first planted wildflower seeds, the seeds spend their first year or two putting down roots and letting all the weeds come up. So they keep mowing the weeds down till the, I guess, till the wildflowers turn around and start popping vertical or coming up. But, oh, thank you. Why not burn? I don't know. That's a good question for them. I uh, don't burn. last time I owned 500 acres, it. Uh, <laughs> it's not brush. It's wildflowers. Yeah, but they could have done no, it early on. Not the grass. Dorothy would like to talk to you. Let me readmit somebody. You visit their farm. It yeah. is so up and down that burning would be very dangerous because it could so easily get out of control. Some of the places that Mike took us when we went there for a tour were so steep on both sides, he could not turn around on the top of the hill and had to back all the way back to get out of it. So uh, it would be best not to try to burn. Sure. Well, there are controlled ways to do that. But Certainly wouldn't do it on the steep hills. Let's see if they're back. No. I think he's rebooting his computer. It's an amazing piece of property. Yeah. <laughs> the other reason they don't burn, this is his little sister. Um, is that it kills uh, the insect eggs and um, so on that create some of that biodiversity. And Marcy can give you an outstanding explanation of that. If any of you are road cyclists, this driftless area is an amazing extremely challenging um, part of Wisconsin to ride bikes in. Um, some of the hilliest terrain that I've ever ridden. It's uh, an amazing part of the part of Wisconsin. I put in the chat, there's a channel two show next Wednesday on the Driftless area. Yep, see that. Yeah, if everybody hadn't heard, there's a chat feature you can turn on or off and we'll list some questions there and hopefully we'll catch those up at the at the end. Um, so they're not burning. I didn't realize you could even maintain prairie without burning. Maggie, do you want to take that while your brother's logging back in? Sure, although I'm a city kid and I know about 0.04% <laughs> of what they know, but um, so that's that's what I've always heard too, is you burn the prairie to, to keep it open. But what Marcy has found out is that that kills the eggs of overwintering insects. And this is true in our yards too. And so when people 
clear all the stubble of, of the little tiny plots of native plants. Um, the burning, you know, it, it, it's, it's better to mow, but Marcy's the one. Are they back on? I think they are. Can you hear us, Mike? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Do we pay extra for the uh, secondary speaker? Matt <laughs> says you owe her. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, Maggie's Maggie's rocking here. She should just let her carry on. Maggie, you want some pictures? I can give you some pictures to, to go with what you're saying. You sound much better. Something happened. That sound felt, felt like Well, I think we were uh, pushing the limits with uh, something. And so I'm going to. I'm going to go a little easier on Zoom uh, and see if, if because uh, what I was doing was I was pushing full bandwidth sound through Zoom in the super hi-fi stereo setting. And I have a feeling that that was a little more than Zoom could handle. So um, I'm going to, I'm going to try it a different way. I'm sort of frantically putting it back together again because um, I'm amazed at your internet connection for being out in the <clears throat> prairies. Oh, you know, if you're out in the prairies and you have fiber to the home where you can get a gigabit symmetrical, it's not too bad. Wow. All right. I'm more jealous. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> it's it just sucks being us. Um let me just see. Oh, I got no audio files at all. I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk through it. Okay. Or uh, even better, uh, why don't we take a question break, and and Marcy and Maggie can rock out with the Q and A while I work on this. You want to? Sure. Well, actually, yeah, actually, I had asked a question, and we were hoping you could enlighten. Uh, sure. More about why you don't need to burn and you're mowing instead. Um, well, so a lot of people burn prairies, you know, um, that's sort of the standard way to maintain a prairie. And um, we, we have done some burns in the past, a few, um, but one of the pro well, there are lots of problems with burns. One of them is that there are only two of us, and so it's really hard to do a burn safely. Um, it's very scary. We've done a few with just two of us, and it's hard. And um, if you want to get other people involved, then you set up the whole thing. And sometimes the weather, you know, you set it up for next Sunday and next Sunday comes and the weather doesn't work. So we've done that a few times too. Um, so it's really complicated to do burns um, safely. Um, another problem is that I think um, people have exaggerated ideas of what burns will do for your prairies. They think that'll solve all the problems and they really don't. Um, so that's another thing that we found um, is that burns actually cause some of the some problems and they don't solve the problems that we wanted to solve in a lot of cases. Um, but another problem is the one that Maggie was talking about when I came in anyway, which is that um, burning kills a lot of animals. Um, it kills anything that can't run or fly away. And there are a lot of insects, for example, in stages of their lives where they can't uh, run or fly away. Like if you think of caterpillars or um, any kind of insects, if you burn in the winter, there are all kinds of insects that live um, in the duff um, at the bases of plants and also in the stems of plants. And all of those get burned up if you burn a prairie. So you have to be careful when you burn prairies that you don't burn them too often or uh, too large an area. It used to be, you know, when there were prairies everywhere in, in North America, um, it wasn't too bad because you'd burn one area and there were prairies all around it and things could repopulate from those areas. But now prairies are more like islands. And so if you burn a prairie, you burn up everything, and there's nowhere for the uh, animals to come from to repopulate it. So we we just decided for our land, we will not burn unless we really need to. So that's what we've done. Does that make sense? 
So I'm ready. Yeah, yes, thank you. I'm ready to try. Okay, Mike's ready to go. So we'll do more questions later if you want. I'm gonna I'm gonna cut this really short because we're almost at the top of the hour, and so uh, I'm I just want to show you a few things because you know one of the things that's really neat to listen to is all the birds that are here, and so I'm just gonna whiz through and again. Uh, Ben, if you can give me a thumbs up if you can hear this. Yep, we're good. Yeah. Okay. I'm not gonna do the fancy hi-fi sound. So there's a blue wing warbler. There's a peewee. And see the shapes? See how oh, you might, did you want to share your screen again? Oh, oh. That's okay. our we're listening. We're listening. We're good. Yeah, here, watch this. Watch this at the same time. Watching it's more fun. Yeah, it's pretty cool. This this business of being able to see the bird calls and identify things is just a, a ton of fun. So there's the, you know, that's the, let me, that's the incredibly piercing blue-winged warbler. Here's our little peewee. Uh, and so on and so forth. So, that, you know, that's one example. Uh, here uh, were some whippoorwills that were singing. Forever. But down here, Is, is an owl. I can't hear it. Just barely hear it. And up here is a woodcock. That's where we really need the hi-fi sound. We'll see. So, you know, th this is the kind of stuff that comes off these recorders. And I get six hours a day of this stuff to listen to. Um, sometimes, most of the time, the recordings are marred a little bit with, anybody want to guess what this sound is? That's a jet. Here it comes. You can hear the blue wing warbler going in the background. The jet's ruining everything. And one of the neat things that software like this can do is you can edit that away. So if I slide over here and I grab me a copy of it, go back here, oops, wrong hand motions. I'm a little frazzled given the meltdown on. Jet be gone. Now we don't have a jet to contend with. And we've got beautiful birds. So on and so forth. I was gonna go into a little more detail on that. And then finally, let me just skip you through what dawn at the house sounds like a little bit. It starts off with, this is in uh, May, May 20th with the peepers. This is an hour of audio, so we're not going to listen to the whole thing. Uh, then the birds start coming in. You can see that there are the peepers right there, just singing away. The birds start coming in just a little bit. The, peep the peepers start to fade away. Cat bird brought in a cat. There's a drink your tea. Morning doves. Those are the morning doves down in there.
Oh. And we don't just get birds. get these um was that coyotes yeah I, I wanted to get to the end slide so that for those of you who want to learn more about this here are the the links to lots of stuff um prairie haven is the site that uh, marcy maintains we hey mike mike this is ben it. yeah this is ben um, you mentioned it would have been fun to have recording equipment 20 years ago, but even in the years that you've been recording, do you do you see an uptick in diversity? You know, we, we've only really been doing this full tilt six hours a day times three locations, 18 hours a day for a year. So Got it. What, what we're really in right now is sort of the baseline. Sure. The starting point. Okay. Yeah, and you know, my I don't exactly know where this stuff is going to go. My hope is that uh, I can find uh, a university or a researcher or somebody for whom the it, you know I think at the end of twenty years this is probably a hundred or two hundred terabytes of data that they uh, get to analyze. There's there's this really cool software that I think it's going to, I'm a pretty good geek and I'm struggling to learn this software. But once you get mastery of it, this is software that's designed to go through these massive amounts of audio data and pick out what birds are calling when, how frequently they're calling, all kinds of really cool stuff like that, that uh, I haven't. I haven't mastered. So this is really kind of a bet on the future project right now. It's not. Um, that segues into a question here. Uh, Joan, I don't know if you've had redheaded woodpeckers on your property. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's one of the birds that I would love to have nesting here. We've seen them. We see them the last three or four years. We've seen them every year, but it's always during migration. So we keep hoping that they're going to look and go, hey, that's a good spot <laughs> and come back and nest. But so far we have, we don't have any nesting here. Sure. Sure. Sorry about the point of view change. No, that's I right. I'm really confused when it, <laughs> when it fell down. So just putting it back in order. Um, on your early seeding of the prairie wildflowers, did you, after several years, do you keep seeding or is that just an initial kind of kickstart? You know, we're, we're doing, we were doing so much of it that we couldn't really do more than, we did one 20 acre prairie a year. And we just didn't have time to go back and put more seed in. But the nice thing about having all, you know, we planted a lot of seed. And as soon as those uh, plants mature, they're starting to put seed out. Got it. And so- Well, most of these are a one year seeding and the rest is- Right. Either maintenance or just letting it go to right go to see. Okay, yeah, pretty much. Audience, if you have any questions for uh, Mike and Marcy, please throw them in the chat. Or uh, here's Jerry wants to know if you've thought about introducing bison on your property. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've thought about grazing animals um, because a lot of people are experimenting experimenting with that. The problem is that we'd have to put fences around it. And it's, you know, 500 acres is a lot of land and it would be a lot of fences and you'd have to maintain the fences. So, no, we haven't. Yeah, maintain the bison. <laughs> part. That's right. right. Okay. Um, we have a lot of ticks on, on the property. Yes. Yeah, and they've just appeared. Yeah, we got them today <laughs> on the walk. We each got ticks. one. Wow. Is it, uh, what kind of ticks do you get? Oh, several different kinds with the, the, you know, the little bad ones and big, big ones and, you know, lots of kinds. 
we, we just have to be very... Um, you have masking tape at hand at all times. Right. If you ever get a tick, you just stick the masking tape on, roll it up, throw it in the wastebasket, carry on. Right. Do you have a, uh, a question about buckthorn? Do you have buckthorn on your property? We do. Um, we don't have as much. I think buckthorn is a thing that kind of um, tends to move out from cities because people plant it in gardens in cities. So we do have it, but we don't have it nearly as bad as uh, the areas right around the Twin Cities. You know, if you drive out from the Twin Cities, that those edges are really full of buckthorn, and we don't have any places that are that bad. But we do have it. Yeah. Yep, I spend quite a bit of time cutting buckthorn. Actually, uh, honeysuckle is a much worse problem for us. Wow. We have a lot more of that. Okay. Uh, Causes the same kind of problem, you know, fills up the woods. A couple of months ago, we had a uh, presentation on a property in Elk River. It wasn't as large as yours, but the same idea where they took an old farm and uh, maybe a third woods, two third farm uh, land in our several years down the path of restoring it. It's right where the Elk River uh, greets the Mississippi. Hmm. And, uh, yeah, they've had some pretty good luck with diversity of like bird counts and frog counts. Great. I'm wondering if you uh, share any of your learnings. Uh, with other nature centers that are involved in prairie restoration. I'm thinking of one that I volunteer at is Belwyn Conservancy and mm -hmm. Afton along the St. Croix. And another one was a Cedar Creek. We've talked to people at those places. Um, we, you know, we give, give presentations like this periodically. Mm -hmm. um, we've never talked to anybody at Belwyn before, so. We love talking to, you know, there's a, a group called the Prairie Enthusiasts in Wisconsin, and it's kind of sneaking into a little bit of Minnesota. Um, wow. I think there are two groups now in Minnesota. Um, and that's a, a pretty good group to get involved in. And, you know, we have a lot of connections with those folks, wow. yeah. sort of spreading the word about prairies. Well, I'm, th I'm thinking that your um, recordings of birds um, and the, the sounds of insects uh, on, on the prairie would really be an interesting project to put at uh, at Belwyn. So, you know. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. I'd love to get a whole bunch of people in a bunch of different places going on this so that we could start yeah. getting baseline data for the region. Yeah, I think that's uh, really interesting. I like, I like your term. I mean, it's it's good to lament the fact that you didn't have the sound recordings from 20 years ago, but 20 years from now, you will have them, you know? Right. So um, that's, it's the, the baseline data, I think is extremely important. You know? um, and so I, I really appreciate your work and what you've done there. I, I suggest that you might want to try contacting the Science Museum of Minnesota. I know it's Minnesota and not Wisconsin. Oh, uh, we're, we're but we speak they, Minnesota. We come you know, from Minnesota. They have really a large um, uh, database of, of birds, and they're trying to make that database go uh, national. And so um, you might want to talk with them. I can put you in touch with, I can't remember the person's name uh, at the moment, but I could put you in touch with that person if you're interested. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. Marcy, we've got a question here. John's asking, any tips on getting rid of garlic mustard? Oh, it's a lot of work. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I used to just pull it, which is the sort of standard thing that you do. And it's very slow. It's, it's really a lot of work. And I've discovered that um, spraying it with uh, Roundup is much faster. And we have so much of it. I just have to spray it. I couldn't possibly pull it all. So I spray really early in the spring before the other stuff is, has come up very far. 
and you can spray and you can spray early in the spring and you can spray late in the fall and you're not hurting much else um, and it's much much faster than pulling but it's just work you know there's supposed to be a, uh, they were developing a um, biological control I can't remember what it is I think it's a couple different beetles um, and they it's at the point where it's um, they've applied for to the um, whoever they apply to in the government to ask them if it's okay to to um, use it and it's sort of stuck in the regulatory phase um, but I keep hoping that they're going to come up with that because I think that's the only solution in the long run for garlic mustard because it's just so it spreads so fast it has so many seeds and it's so hard to get rid of so you just have to just have to work at it. Kind of a segue from that, as the native plants become more established, is it less maintenance on, say, your, your wildflower prairies? The planted prairies are pretty stable. Um, we don't do a lot of maintenance on them. You know, people say, well, you have to burn all the time and you have to mow all the time. We actually don't. Most of those prairies, we don't do anything. Um, yeah. We cut, if there are little trees that come in, we, I cut and treat the trees. Um, and some of the prairies are getting some bushes and things coming in that I have to deal with. But that's, it's not that much work. Um, the things that are actually more work are maintaining areas that we've restored. So um, the savanna areas in particular, um, because there were, weedy things and little trees and bushes in there for so many years there's lots and lots of seeds in the soil and so when you clear it all out all of a sudden everything gets a lot of sun and everything comes back up so that's a lot more work than the planted prairies which are were in crop fields so the the um the weeds were controlled for many years by the farmer so yeah. There aren't nearly as many weeds to deal with, and they and the prairie plants hold their own pretty well. Hmm. Uh, Darlene asks, "Have you put any of the recordings up on eBird?" And I use eBird. I hadn't thought about them as a source. Um, the answer is no, um, mostly because I'm a little overwhelmed with how much I've got. That I haven't had time, you know, we have a lot of birds here and uh, the only way I could deliver recordings right now is in one hour chunks, which is not the way eBird wants them. They want isolated examples of uh, bird calls. And gotcha. as you heard from that little snippet, I almost never see isolated bird calls here because we have so many birds that they're always on top of each other. So uh, that's a whole uh, endeavor that I'd love to do, but uh, I haven't figured out how. This is exciting. Okay. Any others? Did I miss any? Um... Well, last call on the slide of links and then I'll I'll release your screen so that people can see each other. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. We should just explain that the bottom one is Seasons 2020, which is our annual um, slideshow with um, the sounds from here. So um, that link will take you to that. I think that it was already it was sent out to um, everyone. Oh, this is the video. Oh. That's yeah. the video. The right. video is, yeah, if anybody missed that earlier, it's posted, the link is posted on the event page on the website. So if you find tonight's talk, the link is on there too. Okay. And yeah. then the middle one is Mike's site, earsinthedriftless.com. Yeah. And the top one is mine, Wait, Perry Haven, which is about the restoration part. And Ears in the Driftless has a, a, a one hour. I think that one hour piece that we started to listen to is on there and there are several more. And then there are some little mini videos. I'm starting to do a video a month, just taking a 
quick grab of some sound and a quick grab of some video and so there's a lot to to watch there on that site too okay i'm going to release the share and then just a note if anybody missed the uh, if you've got family or friends that you want to mention this to this is on the saint paul audubon youtube channel uh we'll turn off the live feed here in a minute and then it processes during the night and it'll be up in the it'll be available on there tomorrow morning we hope <laughs> is that right <laughs> Thanks, Maggie, for covering for us. Yeah, really. Way to go. It's, it sounded great when we came back in. Well, it sounds like we're about out of out of questions. So, uh, Mike and Marcy, uh, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. Uh, I'm sure I know I've learned a lot more about uh, hard work, uh, the hard work of putting together uh, planting a, a prairie. It's, uh, it's amazing work you've done there. So I, I thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it was it fun. It was fun. Thank you. A little exciting in the middle. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, well, things happen. Yeah, sure does. Okay. All right. I think we'll call it. And, uh, and thanks. Then, Let us know if you uh, do bird tours in the spring. We'll come out and see you. We would love to have people come out. Actually, we have, you know, if, if you get a group of people together, um, at this point, Everybody has to be vaccinated, but that's the only rule. Yep. Yep. Um, and uh, if you want to come down, just let us know. We'll figure out a time. That yeah. would be fun. We found a, an older couple in the suburbs of San Antonio that somewhere in their past, they grabbed a piece of land and the suburbs grew up around it. It's called Warbler Woods. And this woman owns, I don't know, 150, 200 acres or something, basically in the suburbs. And she invites the world to come in in the spring and the fall and count warblers with her. And wow, wow, yeah, she's, we she, we don't go that far. She's trying to hold on to it, and huh. yeah. I think the taxes will eventually drive her out. But. Yeah. We can't have people just kind of wandering around because right. Right. We, we have all these projects. We can't have people all the time. But it, you know, if you if you want to bring a, a group or two groups, we can certainly do that, and we would love to meet. That'd be fun. Who are interested in this kind of stuff? Yeah. We, we can use a helping hand now and then. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the work crew. Find projects for you to do. There's things to do. Okay. All right. You've got, you got projects. Um, yeah. Well, if if you thought about that, um, I'm I um, I'm a master naturalist, and I know um, they're always looking for places that volunteers can volunteer at. So. Um, that might be a possibility. Uh, we could put up a request uh, from you uh, on the Master Naturalist site and get, get, get some volunteers and get some help there. You know, the problem that I have is that if we do things like that, I have to be an organizer. Yeah. I actually like doing the work more than I like organizing people to do the work. <laughs> so uh, yeah. I always, you know, I. I wouldn't mind if it was a couple people who were friends and and would like to come and help, but I yeah. don't want to organize big groups of people. It's just yeah. not my right. idea of fun. Right. We got oh. you. All right, everybody. Thank you. We're going to call it and uh, enjoy. Everybody, stay safe. Enjoy the spring. Yeah. All right. Good night.